I think if you could apply that same level of bias to length of exercises, you'd probably get even better results. But if you are in the absolute fear of like, look, the judges told me that I can't have one more millimeter of quad, then you may have to rely more on these exercises. Welcome to the N1 Experience, brought to you by N1 Education, the leader in fitness education. All right, so so for all the people watching, the answer is there wasn't a, a lot, there wasn't influence into the squat technique or how much data you were collecting and reporting in terms of range of motion. Basically, the consensus was just try and keep it simple right and comfortable in terms of in terms of the techniques okay uh, and we will yeah. be transparent moving f in terms of like i would do want to get those out there so um i think we'll answer a lot of those questions once we get those out there like the the silhouettes yeah the exactly about. so yeah. that's why I, that's what i want to include in the paper itself. Yeah. Yep. i th i mean we should probably be getting pretty close with ai where you could basically take a video and that would be able to blur somebody's face and like whatever so basically it would just be an artificial representation of of their motion without like actually showing anything about who the the person wants right we got to yeah. we got to be get, getting pretty close there um you know i'm sh i'm i'm sh i'm sure of that yeah there's a lot of weird things in research where like not including something like i've never seen videos i've never seen um, people confirm that they did things with video evidence, which I think would be interesting in terms of like uh, non-supervised studies. So you you do that? Yeah, we video all of our stuff, right? Because we we're not bound by any rules, though. Yeah, we're just we're, we're just we're just we're we're just doing like garage lab stuff over here. Of like just like hey, we want to compare these things, you know, and it's in the population that we care about or whatever. So yeah, so yeah, I mean, and it's cool because most of our like most of our participants are. You know, they're a lean, fit population, so it's like you can see where all the muscles are. You can see them working. You can see the sensor placement on that or whatnot. Like, you know, it, if you throw an EMG on somebody that's got a high body fat content without the ultrasound, do you really know that the muscles there are not, right? But one of the nice things is, you know, like we work with a, you know, a population and, you know, are able to do this. And that's like, for me, like, because everything that we do is very, like, I don't, like, I don't do 40 participants you know, when I'm comparing exercises or whatnot, you know, I'll do five or six, right? And so what I look for is that I get very, very consistent stuff across those five or six. And then, yeah, we have the we have the video evidence so you can see exactly how the reps are performed, the tempo is performed. You can actually see, like, when we're doing EMG and MOXIE, you can actually see those values relative to where they are, the rep and the set and stuff like that, um, which, I, you know, which I think is cool. I mean, you know, when, when the proxies are limited, you want them to be, you want to be as transparent as possible as you can with that information because it's it's very easy to manipulate emg data if you've really if once you kind of understand like what it takes to be able to like shift that shift a bias towards something or you know create a little bit of resultant force that will do something else it's it can be very very easy to manipulate that with something that most people would be unaware of as a compounding variable in an exercise um so I think, yeah, like I really like, like I'm a hundred percent with Brett's argument in that review of, I think that we should have, you know, photo and video and stuff, especially for exercises like squats and stuff. And it would be great to see those individual data points and, you know, like thinking big, you know, if we, you know, imagine that we had all these biomechanical data points for all of these squat studies, you could run some sort of regression then on anthropomorphics relative to, you know, certain outcomes. Right. So, and that would be, you know, that would be, that would, that would be something really cool because, you know, we're not getting squat studies with hundreds of participants, but if we had, if we had that nuanced data across a bunch of studies, we could run a lot of regressions on there. Kind of like what they just did with the, uh, with the training to failure study. Yeah. And that's true actually for data in general, even without video or pictures, just like being open to share your data would answer a whole lot of questions that we have that we can't answer just because people have it, you know, locked in their computers. So yeah, it's kind of sad. I mean, I could go on forever on this topic. Um, I think that a lot of authors, for example, on papers or, you know, data is available upon request. So they're open to sharing their data, but ideally your data would be shared before even being requested. So for example, I'm not sure if you considered it, but 
sharing it openly on something like OSF, share your data, share your analysis code, because I saw you use OR for some stuff. Um, that's likely a good thing to do so that in the future it's more easily meta-analyzable. But in general, academia, for all its good sides, it also has the downside of being very bound by tradition and some dogma as well with regards, for example, of, with regards to example, for example, uh, to like not sharing images as much or videos of how things were performed and stuff like that. Like that's kind of just tradition at this point that you don't include that media in, um, these highbrow academic papers. Yeah. It's just a way of tradition and dogma almost or academic, uh, yeah, academic environment, culture. So. Yeah, for sure. And we're obviously very, I mean, we're very quick about, like, we've had issues with people not sending their data. We're very quick about sending it, but also totally open to just including it there as well. Yeah, probably easier. Um, I had a quick question, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So I saw you used EMG to see whether or not uh, Surface EMG would predict longitudinal adaptations. There has been some data recently around this. I mean, there's both been two rebuttal papers by Vygotsky over the years about using surface EMG as a proxy for logical growth, but there's also been some recent data around potentially using it um, when, for example, using um, trypanosomous relaxation MRI. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, um, oh, shit, I'm blanking on the author's name now. Ogasawara, I think? No, not Ogasawara. Was it Ogasawara? Probably was. He rings a bell, but I know what you're talking about, where they look at T2 MRI and then they right. see which regions are, you know, right. more yeah. activated, uh, which some of that data looks kind of weird, if I'm being honest. Like, in terms of, you know the longitudinal outcome, and then you see their acute T2, uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, that brings me actually to what I was going to ask about is, uh, obviously you saw that in your paper there was not really a, an association between EMG and growth at all. Yeah. Um, you even mentioned that you kind of tried to fit a variety of models to it. Now, obviously, in the end, you kind of concluded that there wasn't really an association there anyways. But my curiosity is, did you somewhat try and control for false positive error rate with trying to fit the different models to the data? Yeah, so that would be a question for Vygotsky. Andrew Vygotsky did the... St I mean, like, so the mediation analysis he did, he spent probably about 30 minutes trying to explain to me how the mediation analysis works. And like, it is dense. Like that is definitely a Vygotsky question. And even when you look at like the conference intervals on the mediation, and he was very explicit about not calling it a mediation. So it was a mediation-esque analysis. And uh, the numbers don't make sense in terms of like when you look at the conference intervals, the actual numbers make sense, but the conference intervals don't. So there's just an issue with 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 um the inter the exact interpretations of that model, I think the more clear ones are region specific correlations. Uh, the mediation analysis, I could not answer your question on. <laughs> and that's what you were asking about specifically, right? Yeah, yeah. And what's your best takeaway with regards to the EMG findings of your study? Because you didn't really mention them very much when you explained the findings earlier. Yeah, so the reason I, I figured like that would be a whole other topic of conversation, but just in short. If you look at between individuals and their amplitudes by region or mean and peak, and if you look at within individuals, their um, regional mean and peak amplitudes, there was like very little correlation with uh, longitudinal outcomes. So, um, and, and I don't think that's a huge surprise to even the people in the EMG sphere because they're such different exercises. I question whether... You can do it with in any context, and me and, and Kaz went back and forth on this uh, a little bit uh, off the air, but I, I think a lot of the time what we're doing is overlaying what we believe to be the physiology and what would happen with EMG in that context and sort of trying to fit the story as opposed to just um, looking at a measure that's actually predictive. Yeah, the EMG conversation could be a whole, uh, like a, a whole podcast. Other topic, and yeah. Probably one that like would put people to sleep. Um, so yeah. I'll try to keep this very brief in that like, I think it's very important that like when we're looking at this, um, that we separate the limitation of EMG as a technology versus like what, like our ability to use it in a comparison of these two exercises. So we actually went back and forth uh, on DMs like, you know, months back or whatever on 
the difference in amplitude between the lower portion of the glutes and the upper portion of the glute, right? It's, it's a very substantial difference, right? For a variety of reasons between body fat and, you know, where the nerves are, et cetera. So, um, when we're, when, you, when we're doing this and if you get anybody at home can do this, like if you take your bicep and you like flex it and then you like put your finger at like the end of your bicep and then you extend your arm, you'll realize that the, the bicep that was under your finger when your arm was flexed, like that part of the muscle is no longer under your finger. Right. And so that's one of the reasons where when I look at like, well, what can I compare in terms of exercises? It has to be exercises where basically I'm going to keep the same region of the muscle under those sensors, which is why I was talking about like, okay, well, maybe I can do elbow flexion, you know, full range of motion, but in two different shoulder positions, because I'm going to have relatively this, the same sensor placement. Whereas in this example, what actually is happening is as you are going into a lengthened position, what you are doing is you are putting more and more of those inferior fibers that have a much lower amplitude underneath the sensors as you're getting into the length and position. So you're it, 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 in, in a squat, right? The sensors are simply being placed over the portion of the tissue that we already know has a lower relative amplitude. And then the reverse, when we're working on an exercise, it's more relatively to a short position. So there's already, there's already a bias in that just the way the tissue is moving underneath is we're kind of moving between that. And then you take into the account that like, you know, EMG is not going to directly record, re, uh, correlate to mechanical tension, right? Um, but, and then if we look at how length tension relationship works, we'd know like, well, okay, if we look at a model where once we start introducing those passive elements that we're getting more per fiber tension, we would expect that you would need less relative motor recruitment for the same amount of whole muscle tension because fewer fibers would be able to produce that load. So we would expect that exercises that were more on the lengthened or more of those passive elements were in play, that there would be a smaller percentage of amplitude relative to the same amount of force production. Right. You know, and obviously then you have to layer on like the moment it was less. So there's a, there's a lot of complicated things. So, um, I don't think that that means that the actual technology, like in terms of like, Hey, can we, could we use amplitude as something that might be a, a halfway decent proxy? I don't think it's worthless because we do see that it correlates very well to some of the things we look at biomechanically. Like if you're using a heavier load, going closer to failure in the same exercise, you see all of those things correlate. But all of a sudden when we start moving around into different contexts, that's where then the limitation is, is like, well, we're not necessarily measuring the same thing when we're measuring these two different exercises and we're not necessarily measuring the fibers under the same length tension conditions. So relative amplitude is, is different. So what I would like to see is us actually investigate this question directly and to see if like, can, can it be used in a way where there's like, Hey, these are the, con these are the prerequisite conditions that you need in order for this to be a useful proxy. And then these are the things that would exclude that. And I think that would also then give us a way of looking kind of at the past research and knowing like, okay, what kind of dis to discard and what maybe we could potentially use as inspiration for longitudinal design versus what's like, okay, this, this, these results are not even worth looking at or you're considering because they're not even measuring the same thing versus another context. But like, okay, we're at least, we at least have data that's like measuring the same conditions and the, in the, the same actual muscle tissue. So if we have this inference, then that might, you know, inspire us to do a longitudinal study or, or something, you know, with a little higher confidence. Um, okay. That's, that's my EMG ramble there. Um, and you know, I've listened to Andrew talk about this and stuff and I, I, you know, I agree and disagree on some of the things. And I think a lot of it is just that if you, if you just have to put a label on it and be like, okay, if you don't know anything about it, should you use EMG as the thing to blindly guide your training? Should you use EMG studies? Absolutely not. But if we could get to the point where we knew when it was actually appropriate to use that information, then potentially then it could be a valuable proxy, right? So, yeah. but obviously nothing's going to beat out pure longitudinal work, but you, I mean, the time, the expense, et cetera, right? Like, you know, so, you know, everybody wants things, you know, quicker, faster, cheaper. So I'm all, I'm all for that. 
Yeah, for sure. I think the issue is is that we currently don't know in which context it will be more useful or not. We can speculate and a whole lot of things make a whole lot of sense, obviously, but we currently don't have any specific context where we have longitudinal evidence to show, all right, in this context, we can be more confident in the data. So, yeah, and I hope we can, you know, come together and... Uh, because I don't like running longitudinal studies. Like if we had a proxy, yeah. I would be extremely happy to. So if anything, we're like people, people are often under the assumption that we're looking to shoot down technologies when really what we're trying to do is the exact opposite. Try to find something where we can make good predictions without running every single iteration of every single longitudinal study. So longitudinal yeah, sure. studies are the worst to run. Yeah, just I'm glad uh, I, I found someone who can empathize here because obviously you've run. <laughs> uh, it is, it's a lot of work. It's very repetitive. It's a lot of work. It's compared to acute studies, compared to crossover studies, compared to a lot of those other design types. It's a lot of work. So if you if you're that person behind the keyboard right now, typing up a storm about why the study wasn't uh, 26 weeks instead, and uh, why people didn't do six sessions a week instead of whatever. Consider that there's someone in the lab right now, for the past eight hours, looking at someone do hip thrusts or squats, and considering never looking at a gym, looking at someone hip thrust or going to the gym ever again as a result. Yeah, seven, seven to five every day, I was in the gym, so it was uh, lovely. Well, sure. People, people were making jokes about me being in the dungeon all day because the gym is downstairs. So yeah, and it doesn't get a lot of good airflow. So another confounding variable potentially to wondering. <laughs> there we go. Um, so yeah, it was not fun times. My empathy, my condolences. Yeah, although there is, you know, not not all doom and gloom. There's a whole lot of, uh, especially in untrained individuals, you you get to sort of get make people passionate about lifting and see them make tons of progress. And just like if you look at the strength numbers, oh, actually, I didn't mention the strength numbers. So yeah, that's a, this is probably a, a good segue so they got really really strong in the hip thrust strong in the squat the carryover to the deadlift was actually the exact same so 20 pounds in both groups which is kind of crazy that it landed on the same number um what to make of that in untrained individuals not entirely sure but uh it was an interesting finding nobody cares about strengths when it yeah to- I, I agree they just, <laughs> they just want to know how you get that thick yeah I mean, to be fair, it is interesting to see that uh, the hip thrust and the squat seem to be roughly equally effective at improving your deadlift. So they both work reasonably well as accessory exercises or whatever, uh, which is cool to know, I guess, but not that interesting either. Comparatively, I wouldn't say that those were like great improvements, like when you look at like the amount of load in the deadlift or whatever. So I still say like they were, they were equally modest. Right, at improving the deadlift. Like it wasn't like, oh yeah, these are these are great. But I mean, for supplemental perspective, it'd be like, okay, yeah, they both do have, you know, some some transfer, right? But um I imagine like yeah. for instance, if you did the RDL that you'd see a much larger, larger transfer, right? Especially especially in beginners. Okay. Um, so I think uh the next thing we'll do is we'll roll into a few of these uh claims and questions uh that I had. I'd sent you some of the ones from the students. Um, but uh like to just to put the cap on the first one because basically I think you know everybody with you know over a hundred thousand followers uh except maybe me and Menno um posted this study with like the very first topic being hey this suggests you know that not all muscles you know respond to length and bias training or the glutes actually are better uh, at short or whatnot. And that was phrased a little bit differently amongst people, but, um, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and just like say, but my position is that I don't think this is, I think it's a real big stretch, like giving all the variables that you should take this study as evidence that the glutes are going to approach be better in the short position and length position, because given all the, I would say all of the confounders kind of work in favor of the hip thrust. So if indeed it was like, oh, because of active tension and the glutes, you know, have a better moment arm in the short position, if that stuff was really, if it was that, if that stuff was really what was going to, you know, supersede muscle length for this, we would have, we would have expected the hip thrust to beat the pants off of the squat, 
So the fact that you chose a little bit wider squat, you know, in the beginner population and it's already not that, the fact that the hip thrust and the squat came out very similar, I'm like, cool. That means that, you know, if, if all you have at home is the ability to do free weight squats and, you know, you have some hip thrust, right, you can use the thrust for more specificity or whatnot, but I don't think it puts the hip thrust above length of exercises that might be a little bit more biased. I don't think, I don't think we get that information there at all. Um, and so I just want to get a consensus from you guys in terms of, are we on the same page there or are you guys leaning more towards that? I mean, I don't think it's not a factor, but I think it's such an insignificant factor in this case that I don't even think, I barely think it's worth mentioning that as part of the comparison. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I, I don't think it's not a factor. And I think obviously if things went the other way, then we'd be having a different conversation. But given the results, I, I, I'm pretty confident in saying that it shouldn't be the main um, like story. Uh, the story is not a length story. But I, I also want to point out that different muscles probably confer different benefits from being at longer muscle lengths and certain muscles we just don't have an answer for. So just because it doesn't necessarily ask that question doesn't doesn't mean the opposite. So it's possible. It's still a possibility, but I would be surprised if any muscle benefited more from being in the shortened position as it currently stands, considering all the evidence in every other muscle group. So while it remains a possibility, I think the probability is low. Yeah, I agree with both your takes. I will say whether or not you think that different muscles will benefit more or less so from lengthened training kind of comes down to your understanding what the likely mechanism is behind it. Um, so I think that if your understanding thereof is like related to passive tension, related to something else, that can very much shape whether or not you think different muscles will benefit from it. Um, but yeah, I agree with both of your takes by large. Yeah, so, and I don't think that's clear, by the way, at all. So, like, where muscles exist in the length tension relationship, even the the strongest evidence using microendoscopy is in essentially unloaded conditions, which makes it very hard to make inferences. So, yeah, I don't think you can make really strong claims about the mechanism of length and the length and position in general. Yeah, and that's why until like we see evidence strongly suggesting that it's not a generalizable principle with the fact that we now have data in the calves, in the quads, in the hamstrings, in the glutes to a very lesser extent, the gracilis and sororius muscles, in yes, the biceps, triceps. Um, that's a good deal of different sizes of muscles, shapes of muscles, a variety of things, um, that until we have more clarity on the mechanism or we have more direct data suggesting it's not generalizable, I'm uncomfortable assuming it's generalizable until you have a study on the platysma i'm just i'm just going to assume that some muscles may may still be biased towards the the short position um okay so i'm gonna have i'm gonna piggyback on that and let you answer uh this claim uh from lord voldemort which if you're a follower of mine you know exactly who voldemort is um you know it goes off of the he who, who shall not be named but my fans came up with that not me uh <laughs> If the, you'll know exactly who it, who it is after I read it. If there ever was a study that would favor the glutes, it would be this because it's untrained subjects and passive tension only contributes to hypertrophy at the beginning of training. I don't, I do not understand. Oh, I it's see the whole fascicle. Yeah. yeah, the whole fascicle issue and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm just not on board with any of those mechanisms. Uh, I think it's grasping at straws at... That's the most favorable way I can put that. Um, the The actual geometry is a lot more complicated than that. So I don't think you can make that claim. I don't think we have strong evidence about fascicles plateauing and sort of anything along those lines. So, yeah, that's my take on it. <laughs> Yeah. From, the, from think, that Milo? same group, the fact that you didn't measure fascicle length automatically means that this isn't a, a length, <laughs> length to study. So just, just just debunking that right there. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say I agree with uh, Daniel by large. And I think that as Kasim said, next time, just measure fascicle length. Save us all a lot of time. <laughs> it's pointless otherwise. Sure. Also, there's a lot of back and forth about like the most appropriate way to measure fascicle length. I've seen 
tons of you know issues with that so yeah i'm just i'm hoping so like my postdoc or wherever i end up i think a combination of molecular microendoscopy and also just being able to measure vascular length and get some sort of clarity on how to do all those things but also you know like um there's just so so many issues with the geometry in terms of non-spanning sarcomeres and all that kind of stuff that just like it's really hard to make these claims without like way stronger evidence than we have right now um, just in terms of what happens at the sarcomere itself. So just is the thin filament increasing or is the average sarcomere increasing in length or uh, is do certain muscles traverse the length tension relationship better in terms of like, can you train it? There's some data that like if you train a muscle in a very specific way, you can actually change where it exists in the length tension relationship. So all those things together make me very skeptical of any sort of strong claims in one direction. Or not, or the other. Bro, just create a model and stick with it at all costs. <laughs> Protect that model, hold it close to your chest, and never let it go. Yeah, the five rep thing is is sort of in a similar category. Just like, yeah, it's a it's a cool heuristic, but like, don't don't hold on to it for dear life. Like, you're bleeding at the moment. So, yeah. Okay, so that the the next one that I think. Um... The, it's questionable whether or not we can answer this, um, but you at least like you <laughs> measured all of the all of the glute divisions. So, um, and the question is, or the or the claim is, and uh, I think I think both Brett and Paul have said this at one point in time. And I don't know if we can, you know, if you guys think we can adequately refute this. I mean, I have disagreed with this, but um, the claim is is that the short position is going to work more upper glutes. And the length of position is going to work more lower glutes. Uh, and I think my argument has always been like, well, if you're work, you training hip extension, it's going to be more lower glutes. And then if we start, you know, deviating into some abduction, that's where we're going to start working either the more superior fibers of the glute max or the uh, glute medius and, and minimus. And I think it, if, if you do take the fact that, all right, these exercises were, you know, if you, if you do assume that there's a length difference in here, we would have then expected that if this was true, that would have showed up. Uh, so do you guys think that, like, do you guys agree with this? Or do you think that with what we have in terms of the evidence from this, that that's suggestive? Or do you think that it probably pretty much is that, look, it's, whether or not it's lower versus upper glute probably has more to do with the, you know, the direction of motion that you're loading the femur in rather than the muscle length? Yeah, to me, it makes sense that it's the direction of the femur, particularly in light of these results. So if you look at the upper and middle, they grew fairly similarly and um, with like a 10% increase in growth. And then if you looked at the bottom glute, it was about a 20% increase in growth, so double. So double, uh, this is both groups, so if you were to pull. Um, so I think that's pretty strong evidence just based on magnitude that the lower glute gets more stimulus in these hip extension dominant exercises. So it is one study, you know, like I'd love to see more, but just based on this and, and the magnitude, I'd say the lower glute seems to get more stimulus with, you know, pure quote unquote extension. No, I think that makes sense. And hey, for its worth, when I do my uh, hip abduction, all I feel is upper glute. So <laughs> that's, all, that's all I need to know. You feel me? Yeah. That's fair. Are we What we need to do is like a Warniki, like, so the only way to isolate this question is to do some A, <laughs> so just stretch the crap out of their glute um, and just stay there for an hour per day and see if there's hypertrophy. Uh, sign me up. I'm ready. That sounds so uncomfortable. Yeah, it's uh, bad. So I'm not sure if, I, I think you know, Kasim, but um, I'm not sure if you know Daniel, that uh, Eric actually tried the protocol from mm -hmm. uh, Warnicky and he gave up eventually because hmm. it was actually like very, very painful. Like it's very, very uncomfortable and uh, hey, it's in the calves as well, so he didn't care. Did he use the same yes. tool? Or, or the same orthotic device from like Alibaba Express.com or something? 
I bought one from Alibaba as well, and there's hey. two. There's two versions, and the one that I bought was very, and it wasn't the one in the study, but it was hard to get a deep stretch in the gas truck. Like I, 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 I couldn't get into the position where I really felt that deep stretch. So yeah, I'm just like. It comes back down to like the transparency thing. Like I just want to see like what it looked like, what their experience was, all that kind of stuff. Because one, it was brutal. Even in the position that I was in, like I felt it a bit, like in the the tendon and whatnot. And two, it, it would like didn't feel like a as much of a stretchy sensation. It is still a really cool finding. And now they've done one comparing to actual training. The other one, one was just simply the stretching. And now there's more evidence with a, a training protocol as well. So, super cool finding, but yeah, there's some open questions there. Um, and it sort of gets at the mechanism thing, like, the common paradigm is, like, type 2 fibers get innervated as things get, you know, more and more difficult or the load is heavy enough. But, like, in that stretch position, you know, I doubt that that's what's occurring. So, um, even the sort of tension question, or as it's commonly put out, is sort of under fire, <laughs> so to speak, when you when you look at those kind of outcomes, especially in an unloaded stretch. Okay, so the next question, um, which we kind of we kind of glanced over, but you you chose the uh, untrained population to avoid there being any influence from prior training and familiarity with the exercises. So, uh, say we had a trained population that was equally that an equal familiarity with the exercises uh would you hypothesize that the results would have been any different and if so which way would you have leaned towards yeah it's hard it's hard but most of the evidence doesn't like people talk about trained and untrained individuals and i don't see any common theme in differences in outcomes in actual studies so it's it's hard to make those comparisons in general but if you were to sort of make a case the hip thrust is easier to learn and so perhaps more quickly their nervous system wasn't a limitation so like you could make a very weak argument in that direction but I don't think that that alone would be enough of a factor so my guess is it would be pretty similar I think the reason why a trained population would be really hard here as well is because trained populations are coming in with a certain level of muscularity that you have to sort of account for by either doing more exercises or more sets of the given exercise. So, you, for example, they could lose hamstring hypertrophy throughout the intervention if you only did. They probably would, actually, potentially. Um, so using an untrained population sort of has a blank slate effect that allows you to better isolate the question without having to account for tons of other variables. But I would like to see the study. It would have to be a different design, but I would like to see the study in trained individuals as well. Um, it wouldn't be my first choice, though, because obviously I think we can isolate these questions a bit better. But um, the more the merrier, I guess. Did, did you have any? Did you have an opinion one way or another, Milo, on how you think that trained subjects would uh, influence a study? So I don't think it should influence the results much, personally. And I see the merits of studying untrained participants probably more than the average person. I think the average person, upon reading such a study, will go, well, I'm not untrained. The people in these studies didn't even train hard, and these scientists don't even lift. When in reality, studying untrained subjects serves as a nice way to see big effect sizes um, and be able to take differences more easily. So you don't need as many people in a study to be able to see whether or not something works better than something else. Um, with the squat and the hip thrust, the one thing, and this is down to like what you actually think, Daniel, and how your supervision worked, is I, I'm i kind of torn on this. Part of me thinks that the subjects in the squat group may not have trained as hard unless you really push them. Because I think a lot of beginners especially are kind of failed, scared of failing a deep squat. We're getting close to failure on deep squat. Um, another part of me thinks that especially when being supervised and given that we know that people are actually fairly accurate at gauging how close to failure they train, even if they're relatively untrained, we actually did a paper on that. Um, part of me thinks it'd be fine, but I guess that's my question to you, is do you think the fact that they were beginners at all hindered them and their ability to go closer to failure on the squat? 
Yeah, I'd say that, and that's a good point. I should have probably mentioned that. I'd say that on average, the amount of individuals that were cutting their reps short were a bit higher in the squat group, which obviously makes sense. Anyone that's actually run a study and does, has done volitional failure knows that there's some variation with the amount of individuals and how they're able to push themselves. But there were a decent, you know, a, 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 also a small number of individuals in the hip thrust group that weren't pushing themselves as much as I believe that they could, but slightly less. So without quantifying it, I think the inclination is correct and sort of... Uh, is in line with probably every single study on volitional failure, where if an exercise is harder, it's probably going to be a tiny bit further away from failure. We were pushing them hard, and and there were definitely complaints. But in terms of like knowing for sure that they did not have one rep left, it, it wasn't always clear. And the trend with specific participants who had issues with this is 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 always going to be a, a limitation. But for the most part, it wasn't super lopsided like i've been a part of uh studies that it was it was more evident when people were further away from failure i think this was a really hard working group and and up front i did a better job of saying things that like you you will be training hard like i think sort of scaring people up front uh especially when they're untrained weeds out some people who were like i didn't expect this you know like i told them they were going to be in a lot of pain and they were like after strength testing like that's brutal three rms of all those three lifts like i let them know that there would be uh pain in their future and it was going to be hard training so uh yeah i think i accounted for that to some extent but i think your intuition is correct that that makes a lot of sense yeah yeah it makes a lot of sense um Again, I don't think that's a slight on the study or you. I think it's kind of just how it goes with the squad specifically. Yeah. Um, and I guess that might be contributing slightly to the difference in potentially how close to failure the glutes were in the squat versus the hip thrust. Um, but I think it's a relatively small difference, especially given that from the paper, it sounded like you had one to three people there at any given time supervising the participant. We had, so like it was very spread out where. I, I mean, I was individually with participants almost all sessions. Yeah. Okay. It was brutal so, for that reason, but it was also a lot more like literally me with 98% of the participants other than when I had a class where one individual took over for like two participants. So it's crazy, man. Those sessions, time slows down, you know? Yeah, for sure. Luckily, these were smaller sessions. I've been part of studies where it was like a full battery. So like an hour, these are like 25 minutes. So it was just, you know, five sets, six sets and stuff like that. So um, I could have been nicer to myself and sort of put people in the same slot, but I didn't want to deal with the fact that, you know, like account coordinating. people are coordinating all that kind of stuff. So usually it was a max of two. So two participants. Yeah. And I set the time where I, I, and if it was more than two, I had help with another individual. Out of curiosity, very quickly, how yeah. long did it take you to collect all this data? How long? Yeah, like mm. over how many months? In terms of like analyzing and all that kind of stuff? No, no, just literally collecting data, like as in having people go through the intervention and measuring them before and after. Oh, it was very quick. So there were only two cohorts. So essentially an extra week there. So if it's nine weeks and 10 weeks. So actually collecting was only a brutal like 10 and a half weeks, something like that, because we collected very, like a lot of people do sort of like rolling uh, entry. We capped it at two weeks. So there was group one, which started, and then group two started a week after that. And then we set things up exactly the same. So it was like the EMG, at, uh, the EMG was on Wednesday, the MRIs were on Saturday, Sunday, and there were, yeah, so 11 weeks total. That's a rough 11 weeks, but respect. Very good. Yes. <laughs> Every personal trainer is listening to you guys complain about these sessions, and they're like, it's just a, that's just a Tuesday for me, right? So I was a trainer for <laughs> 70 years, and an hour with an individual is much different than 25 minutes with, like, 50 people, so or whatever, 30, 36 people. Uh, you, you, different conversations, different mental, like you have to like recalibrate your mind for the next person coming in. Remember all the details of their life when you just met them. When you have a cohort of your like 20 clients that you like gain rapport with, it's kind of fun. Um, so, and I was on the gym floor for, you know, hours, uh, like, like similar to, to the study. So I would say to those trainers run 
a study and see what it's like and uh we, we can compare notes both are brutal but um i think one is slightly edges out the other especially when you're being super redundant like it's one exercise you can't make no novelty they know what they're good getting in there for it's yeah um and not only it's that they're pointless. yeah and they're paying you a lot of money too so they're like excited to come as opposed to the person droning in like, ah, oh, you again. You know what I mean? Like uh, there's there's distinct uh, differences. Being a researcher is, is not fun. It's not what most people think being a researcher is like, you know, in that sense. Sure. That's awesome. Um, so you guys already answered the question on effort relative mm -hmm. between the two groups. Um, so the other question in terms of that, uh, was the skill component being untrained individuals, you know, was the fact that a squat is a more skill-based lift, right? Would that in this population have kind of worked against the squat? So not only would maybe they have a harder time pushing to failure, right? But because the coordination demand is higher, their one, the perceived effort would be higher, which correlates to them maybe not wanting to push as close to failure. Um, but also that they just weren't able to get as much recruitment, you know, out of the tissue in a complex squat exercise as beginners compared to the hip thrust as if they were trained subjects. What would you say to that? Yeah, I think it's a similar answer to what I had previously in that it's it's going to be a, a limitation. I think they, they gained a proficiency um, pretty early on, so I was happy with that, but Obviously, there's a higher coordination demand, and it's just a harder exercise to master in general. So, as with all research, um, limitations are come with the territory. There. Um. So, this study is in preprint right now. Um. So a few people ask, like, uh, you know, is the fact that this isn't peer reviewed? you know, an issue. Um, and, you know, I think provided that you guys uh, didn't, you know, fraudulently make your data, like <laughs> you didn't t take one out of the Brazilian group, uh, out of their the playbook. Uh, yeah. yeah. Then, uh, then probably, I mean, cause it, maybe, maybe just kind of summarize what this process is of like, all right, what, what is a preprint and what realistically would change with peer review? Yeah, I can let Milo take this one because uh, I've been doing a lot of talking, but I'd be happy to take it too, up to you. <laughs> I mean, you know what, go for it first and I'll add anything you think there's any shit sure. added. Yeah, so I think people maybe, there's a, there's a lot of angles to take this. I think people might put more stock into the peer review process than they potentially should, and that's an issue, I think, of the field and, and, and of science actually in general, not the field. Um, that peer review could be a lot better. And I think another thing to consider is that the methods of the paper matter a whole lot. So if you're doing some sort of complex statistics and you have somebody that's relatively non-advanced in those statistical methods, or if you're doing some molecular outcome and you've totally botched how you went about doing it methods wise that's where an expert review is useful we're like all right listen you took the tissue and you didn't put it in liquid nitrogen early enough and now your study is like literally a waste in this kind of study where things are like pretty straightforward and you don't expect the review to do much of anything other than cosmetic changes or maybe they want so a lot of the times they ask for stuff which is just like honestly like makes your uh like stats worse like they ask for p-values a lot of the time where like we opted not to do it like the the process is not super super useful in cases where things are very very straightforward so yeah i don't put a lot of stock into the fact that if anything i value preprints more than i value the review process where a bunch of people who are super super passionate about the subject are scrutinizing your data and looking at it from all angles. And instead of two people or three people max, you have hundreds of people telling you where they misunderstood something, what could have more clarity, what did you do in this instance or that instance. So all of this stuff I think is going to be super useful for when we actually submit 
and create a product that people can interpret and understand. I'm going to steel man the peer review process very quickly, and then I'm going to point out what I actually think of it. If we steel man it, we can say, well, most papers don't actually get read all that often. Like the average paper gets something like 13 downloads or something. So if every paper ever was preprinted, assuming it gets fewer reads during preprinting stage than during publication stage, it would get like five reads or something. And certainly no one would read it closely enough to be able to tell any like major issues, right? Um, so peer review can be helpful in the sense that people are somewhat incentivized, and that's kind of one of the issues with uh, peer review. They're incentivized insofar as it's basically doing charity work, right? Like you don't get paid to peer review. So that's one thing to keep in mind is that there's no awards for uh, this person spent eight hours on their peer review of the study and they pointed out so many flaws. It's more like you got an email from an editor somewhere who said, hey, do you want to peer review the study? And you have 16 other things to do today, but you somehow managed to fit it in. You're going to spend 15 minutes on that study reviewing it and give some... Oftentimes, peer reviews are like two lines. You have two lines, it's like, it's like looks good, but maybe your English could be better. So peer review is not this holy ceremonious process through which your paper gets improved many fold, it can really vary in quality. So while I think that it can be useful in certain circumstances for certain papers and like in its ideal form, it can work very well as like a double check your shit type of situation. And sometimes it can even be very informative. I also think that um, I honestly don't care that much. I don't, I think most of the papers that go through peer review don't get improved much as a result of peer review. And it's a weird flex when people say, oh, I've got papers published in peer-reviewed journals. When people say, oh, this paper has not been peer-reviewed. Oftentimes it's said either by people who just kind of like lump science and peer review together as if they're like the same thing, inherently like the exact same thing. Um, or it's said as a as like critic blanket criticism of a paper that someone doesn't like. Um, so I don't think the fact that it's not been peer-reviewed yet, especially given all the covers for getting like I'm not going to name drop, but some people out there, they really don't fucking like the results of your paper. Like, uh, <laughs> I was literally on the, on Instagram like a few hours ago, and I was looking at some person who really likes slow muscling stuff. Hey, I like low muscling stuff too, but I don't hate papers and authors that publish um, opposing views or opposing results. Um, and people really don't like it. So at the very least, in this case, with how much traction and how much coverage the paper's been getting, I really don't think the lack of peer review is something that you should hold strongly against the results of this paper or any inferences. Yeah, I think that's a good point, especially with fields that don't get a lot of coverage, which is most fields. Uh, this process is probably not, you know, ideal for them. But in those cases, it's probably even more important that the peer review is super, super on top of things in terms of letting things go to publication but yeah to your point also you see a whole bunch of stuff get through peer review that you're just like shaking your head so yeah I think we're in total agreement here and there is also very quickly the downside of peer review being that it literally delays publication by often like three to six months like if you can't find reviewers so that's a th three to six months that could have been spent by the scientific community formulating papers and research questions that are a lot more informative so it's kind of delaying the whole process and lagging science out yeah, I've had one in for a year and a half. That's much my longest, so not good. <laughs> yeah, my only comment is I also see things in peer-reviewed papers that me, not I don't have a PhD, right? But, sorry, guys. Uh, but I guess uh, neither do you guys yet. Oh, but um, a lot of, like, like, so if I see stuff and I'm shaking my head at it, I consider that as is like, okay, well, you know, who am I? You know, I'm just, you know, whatever. I'm just a bro here, you know, teaching trainer stuff. And uh, like, uh, like one of the, like in some of the times it's pretty glaring obvious, like that the example that uh, we we're talking about with the open sim model and the tricep literally flipping over the, on the wrong side of the humerus and then them using that to calculate the length tension relationship. And I'm like, that's not even like, visibly you can see that you know the muscle went through the or the same thing with a lot of the um a lot of the moment arm studies on hip extension which would be relative to this right like uh, even even the one that uh was referenced that's used they basically you know they used a an mri image in the neutral position 
but then they built their model on it with straight lines. And so their calculations for hip flexion are, I would say, I would say probably not accurate because it, if you look comparatively, it would require the muscle to be in a place that it physically can't be. Right. So I'm like, well, that's just, this, this is not a possibility. So that means that somewhere in here, like we're not, we're not accounting for that. And to like, I don't know, for me having more of a biomechanics background, those things are glaringly obvious, but I couldn't pull apart the statistics of a paper like you guys could. Um, but I see little things like that and I'm like, Hmm, I feel like there should be somebody that's on my side of the nerd realm that like, you know, it would be part of, would be part of that process sometimes. Um, what advice would you give to people trying to navigate the research landscape in terms of should should they put more trust into a study that's peer reviewed? I mean, you kind of covered that. Um, but the other question I have is when it comes to research and social media, um, like do we do you think there's a limitation? Like, say you have a study and you you have a preprint out. Um, do you think there's a downside to that getting bashed? I mean, everybody wants to be first. So whatever iteration comes out first, nobody's going to resist like holding back and be like, well, I'm going to wait until the final versions and then I'm going to share, right? Like that's just, it's never going to happen, right? N we're not all going to agree like, hey, we're going to wait until the like the good, like most understandable version of this paper is done and then we'll post it. It's like, no, everybody wants to be first. So do you see any potential for misunderstanding or whatnot, or potentially the fact that, you know, if a preprint's published and then it basically makes the rounds on social media, that then that's going to decrease the views of the final version of the paper or anything like that, that potentially would have, would, would you would see as like a negative in terms of getting your information communicated? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's always going to be some negatives. So maybe potentially people already, you know, I read the study, I don't need to read it again kind of thing, I think is what you're getting at there. But I think the, given what we said about the peer review process and the attention that these questions get because they're popular topics, I think things lend themselves much more toward this expeditious way of doing things and more eyes way of doing things. I, I think where you can also get a whole bunch of benefit is the level of transparency of the researcher. So like I'm here right now and I've been pretty good about answering people's questions. So I think what if you just drop a preprint, like you drop the mic and then walk off and then there's there may be some issues because maybe through peer review they would have said oh how like how what did the squats actually look like and so on things that you might have missed and and maybe not been as detailed in in the initial iteration so there there could be downsides but but I think as long as you're as transparent as possible they're pretty minimal and because you mentioned oh, sorry because you mentioned um, that it might reduce the views on the final paper, like the exposure the final paper gets, I actually could almost go the opposite, where I think that having both the preprint release, where you kind of share it around, etc., and the actual publication, in my experience and from some of the metrics I've seen around, it may be the case that having kind of two waves almost um, of exposure kind of leads to a better finished product, where you have kind of discussion around the preprint, you can potentially change some things until publication, like maybe add in some details based on feedback, etc., and also it causes more attention, more discussion, in my experience, it actually potentially serves to have more exposure overall. Now, uh, are preprints always open access? Pretty sure. I think so, yeah. like It's it's very much part and parcel of the open science movement. So I think it's almost always like open science and openly available. Okay, so, so is there a situation where um, if a preprint is open access, somebody might be able to see that, but then it might get published in a journal where then it's no longer open access. So that would be, yep. they would at least get to see that version, but it might be the only version that they would get to see without. Paying. That's correct. And some journals actually kind of have beef with this. Uh, journals are notoriously predatory and not very good by and large. Uh, obviously there's different journals and some journals are good. Um, but the most established and most prestigious one typically um, as much as I'm not necessarily anti-establishment in general, um, with journals, it's a different story altogether where the profit margins are quite large and um, it costs you a lot to publish in a journal, for example, especially prestigious ones. And it costs oftentimes the author several thousand dollars to have it be open access. 
So it costs the authors more to have it be openly available and open to the public so that people can actually read their fucking paper in the end. Um, and so some journals actually have an explicit no preprint policy. Now, how strict they are with enforcing that preprint policy can really vary. But it is worth noting that uh, journals generally don't like it. And so I think it's especially a good thing to do in that case because they don't like it and because it means <laughs> that your paper gets out to more people. Yeah, I agree with that entirely. And I also think that some of the fees are absolutely absurd. Like, not to name the journal, but yeah, 12K, like, get the heck out of here for open access. It's just absurd. So last last comment on this topic. Um, so in terms of, like, long muscle length training research and whatnot, um, it's very interesting how, like, some papers get significantly more reach than others right so i think that you know so, some of some of those papers uh on the partials have gotten some pretty good traction uh, but i think probably mostly limited to the evidence-based community uh they're probably not going to have the mainstream reach that this paper is um so do you think there's any risk of if people do look at this as a long versus short thing that like from a mainstream perspective that would kind of distort what the evidence is as a whole simply because this paper is going to get so many more eyeballs on it one because it's it's recovering a controversial study but two because of the people involved and the popularity and we'll say the stigma around the two exercises yeah i, I can't say much about what people will do but i hope i hope not so I hope that this doesn't distort the issue. I don't think it will, considering all of the sane people in the space are all on generally the same page. Like, I, I actually talked to Dr. Brad Schoenfeld previous to this conversation, and I think we were in total agreement, and I think Milo talked to him very recently, too. So I think um, perhaps some of the wording that we could have used uh, might have been a bit more clear uh, in some of the posts, but overall, I think our messaging is careful enough to say that it is not a length question specifically that's being, uh, assessed here. So, and I think just the overwhelming evidence, like if you're going to ignore the, all the other evidence, you probably shouldn't be making strong claims in the first place here. So Yeah. I don't I don't worry too much about what people who haven't taken the time are, are saying. For sure. And I think that ultimately the impetus and the burden to communicate these findings properly comes down to science communicators, which often are scientists themselves, like in the case of uh, Daniel here and myself to a lesser extent. Um, <laughs> so I think that oftentimes the impetus of communicating these findings with high fidelity and not like blowing it out of proportion or making it seem as though this is a study with the purpose of comparing longer and shorter muscle length training is really important. Um, I think science communication is a whole other um, ball game compared to science itself, uh, especially when you're dealing with lay public which, who may not have the same scientific literacy that than you're accustomed to than you have. And so it can be a big responsibility to carry. I think all the people that have shared the, sto the study around and talked about it um, have done somewhere between a poor and a pretty good job of communicating it, as in the case of Daniel. Um, but it can really vary, and I think it's a big responsibility. And it's a big thing that people will, should be doing well on, but sometimes aren't. Yeah, yeah. And I think to I, to sorry, uh, go for it. I was just gonna say, I think Dana, you've had probably the like the most sound, like post on on the topic i think the messaging has been we'll say the most accurate in in your post relative to the other other people uh that i have shared it but uh you know what happens over the next couple of weeks on tiktok will let us know which messaging takes hold right <laughs> this may also become the most viral the most viral real and tiktok thing you know <laughs> so on that topic to two points one is that uh, thank you for for the for the kind words and two I posted the slides on TikTok and they got absolutely zero traction. I mean I'm a, I'm never on TikTok. I just figured all right the TikTok world potentially you know can see it if they need to. Um, but like apparently videos are strongly in favor over there and also it's just 
just browsing through it, it's m seemingly more of a cesspool than Instagram, which I didn't think was possible, but apparently it's possible. Uh, I think Twitter has them both beat out, but uh, yeah, it's 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 the Wild West. Yeah, dude, you got to show some skin. <laughs> yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> just uh, post the pictures of the um, EMG stuff. Uh, yeah, we actually yeah. have that in the paper. Exactly, so, exactly. Just yeah. post those in that. Or on real note, um, maybe I'm just getting too old, but TikTok is difficult to comprehend for me. Mm. Like, I, I look at the posts and I'm like, this is so fast-paced and random and like, uh, I just don't get it. So you're not alone in uh, yeah. not liking TikTok. I, I respect how, we'll say, powerful the TikTok algorithm is, right? They know exactly what they're doing, right? And that's exactly why I can't, like, I don't have it on my phone. I have a separate phone. So, and, and even, even though all I do is get on there and just like post and ghost, I still only do it like occasionally. And it, and that's begrudgingly because I have to do it for business because it is, man, that thing is just built for like short attention span, but just to keep you on there. Right. And Instagram has just been slowly trying to take pages out of their book and it's becoming more and more. And, and more like that, which, you know, we'll, we'll see how that changes things. But, you know, I think, uh, as you know, in terms of, you know, people that are science communicators, you know, it's, it's going to be a challenge to just keep up with the evolving technology at this point, right? That's just going to be a, a, a constant obstacle. So I think, um, I think I've taken up plenty of your guys' time. Uh, but what I would like to close with for everybody would just be to be a, kind of a position stand on where we think the current like evidence lies with glute training in terms of you know maybe what you think would be the ideal types of exercise uh selections or decisions that people make with that if we can kind of like i mean put that into a kind of a small summary here um you know in terms of maybe like what you th what you think given everything we should be thinking about in terms of range of motion you know exercises that are more isolated versus the compounds and stuff like what can we gather from what little evidence what we do have and what are probably you know if you had to make training decisions today for yourself or your client like what are the you know what are the real decisions that you're going to make sure yeah so i think given the limited amount of evidence sticking with you know the tr tried and true principles makes a whole lot of sense make sure adequate volume make sure to do some amount of isolation work so that wouldn't be a squat um it would be something like a multi-hip something like a hip thrust i'd say in terms of biasing more of your volume toward the length and position versus the shortened position for the glute itself is somewhat of an open question but i think it's it there's there's not an obvious downside to me at all and particularly because you can do it in a whole bunch of planes there's not a dearth of exercises that you could use so i think make sure your volume is adequate i tend to still favor personally my volume more in the length and sort of isolated position uh that's just my current stance now i'm willing to change it with uh further evidence so this is true even for the glute and how i decide to make decisions for my clients, but I definitely don't skip out on thrusts. I'll have them do pulses after a full thrust um, very commonly. So I think using all of the tools at your disposal and making sure volume is adequate and adjusting as needed just makes a whole lot of sense, particularly in light of the fact that we have such little evidence here. Um, in terms of the glute need and man, I think now it's very obvious and uh, to a lesser extent, but pretty obvious for the upper glute, doing some abduction exercises is now sort of a, more of a must, as opposed to earlier when a lot of people were screaming loud about it being like hip thrust being like more upper glute dominant, then potentially you wouldn't have had to do them. So I think the main takeaway, if you're going to have one, is probably do both lengthen and shorten biased exercises, but make sure you're also doing that abduction in different planes so that you can get different regions and include the meat and min and get that full juicy looking peach. <laughs> I mean, by and large, I, I think Daniel said most things. What I'd say is that it looks like hip thrust specifically seemed like a pretty decent way of getting a better ratio of glute growth to everything else growth, right? So if that's something you're after, 
hip thrusts and maybe even bridges could be a decent option, right? Because bridges, if there's something to the neuromechanical matching aspect of hip thrusts that makes them better for uh, glutes specifically, as opposed to like the adductors, um, then glute bridges would stay at yet another level, right? And kind of even further improve that ratio, even though they may not have per set as much of an effect on glute growth. You might just need more sets of them, but they still have a great ratio. Um, in general, picking exercises, if glute, glute growth is one of your top priorities, picking exercises that are very likely to be limited by glute strength is a good thing, right? So generally a squat would rank relatively poorly in that, as well as ranking poorly in terms of the ratio of glute growth to other growth that you get. Um, and finally, as you said, like getting some form of hip abduction work in your training is probably pretty important because it doesn't seem like glute medes and minimus grow much from just pure hip extension work. Um, besides that, I don't think there's a ton to be said. I would say that you can still involve compounds, like the hip thrust is technically a compound, and it's worth keeping in mind that actually, I don't think touched on this, in the study that you ran, there was still some pretty notable quad growth uh, involved, and some pretty notable actual growth, like maybe about half the growth that they saw in the squat group. So it's still like, it's it's not a, it's not as though hip thrusts only grow your glutes, right? They're still a compound fundamentally, but they will preferentially target the glutes compared to say the squat. So that's what I think. Yeah, for sure. I think you could potentially further isolate it was, um, I think, your overarching point. And I think the overarching point of sort of like the length, why this isn't a length question. So, um, yeah, I think that was a good summary. So, like I said earlier, is that this study didn't change a lot for me because it's basically, you know, I mean, if anybody didn't wasn't already taking the approach that a squat was a more diverse lower body exercise than a, you know, a thrust was a more specific exercise, then... I did. I don't know what they what they were doing with these exercises before. They were probably just taking a tribal approach. Um, what I would say, and this is something that just kind of been like a natural transition uh, over probably the last couple of years, is that uh, probably the need, especially for the glutes, to really use exercises or techniques that puts them as the limiter, is is even more important. Like I imagine that if you had the RDL study and then you compared that to say an exercise that was more biased that we still like, even though it's hingy, the hamstrings might be the one they're going to limit the range of motion, but two, just like they might be the thing that fails first. Um, and so, and just this, this just leads me more towards like, look, if you're really trying to, you know, isolate the glutes and get as much hypertrophy out of them, you can't just depend on being at a longer muscle length doing like, being all that you need, you probably should try and make sure that mechanically that the the glutes are also going to be the limiter, and that's probably you need, like you need those two things to kind of line up. And we've already kind of seen that there's a pretty good signal that you need like for length and bias training. It's not just the range of motion, but we also need the challenge to be there as well. Um, so you know that's a consideration when you're looking at things like you know doing hip extensions on a 45 degree back extension and stuff like that. It's like okay, yeah, you know. You could get to a certain length there, um, but you're still limited in both range of motion. But now also the challenge is hardest in the short position, you know. So I look at a 45 degree extension as a very similar exercise to a glute bridge in that it's a little bit more isolated, but you're just going to be able to have more hamstrings in there as well. So again, you know, you could look at the thrust being a little bit more isolated, but I don't think anything's going to be more isolated than like doing your unilateral like kickback type motions and stuff like that. So, uh, and that's an interesting thing when we start talking about the meat and the min, right? Both of these were bilateral exercises. So if you're not going to do direct abduction, that might mean that like, hey, you at the very least probably need to incorporate some unilateral motions to get a little bit more loading across those tissues. But really, if you're trying to hypertrophy those, you're going to need to train them directly with some range of motion and some direct loading, which the final thing that I'll kind of ask you guys was, because that'll be the question is like, well, okay, well, the thrust didn't work much in terms of the glute med, the glute min, and the upper glutes were the, they grew the least out of, the upper glute max grew the least out of all the portions of the glute max, um, would be that uh, the banding of the hip thrust. I look at that and I'm like, 
on EMG, yeah, if we throw bands around the knees and you're pushing into abduction while you do a hip thrust, we're going to see those muscles basically holding somewhat of a, you know, a near isometric contraction, which is going to be very high for EMG. And, you know, as you saw, Daniel, like that portion, that region of the glute just lights up on EMG. It makes it seem like these muscles are working really, really hard, even when you're doing very little things, just because of how, just because of the like bias of how much amplitude you get in that area. Um, but I don't think that that is a ideal way one to do the hip thrust because I think that you're just you're adding complication to your hip extension exercise that doesn't need to be there right and I think you would be better off saving like removing that coordination and just you know getting the thrust but in terms of the lateral glutes the med the min the upper portion of the glute max I think that you like I think it's fairly reasonable that we should be training them with exercises where it's, we're getting range of motion directly in those planes um, and then if we want to take the muscle length aspect into that, right, we wouldn't be getting like anywhere towards the length and position, right? So I think in that instance, we're just making an exercise overcomplicated in a way that might lead to sensation, which that's something we didn't really touch on. But I think this is probably where that re really becomes relevant is, is that there was no correlation between the feeling or the sensation and the exercise. And I know that since glutes has been an area where there hasn't been a lot of evidence and not a lot of, you know, confident, you know, answers to these questions is that a lot of people have been like, well, I feel this, you know, or I do this or whatever, right? Uh, even to the context where sometimes it's like, well, I feel it on somebody else, uh, which, you know, was always an interesting thing when it comes to glute training of if that's how you're evaluating your client's <laughs> exercise of like, hey, you know, I can, you know, get in there and I can, I can feel the glutes working. Um, there was no correlation between that. And I think, you know, sensation is a very complicated thing. Um, so we're... Where do you stand on, like, should we be relying on those yellings to fill in the gaps um, or maybe more in a mechanical perspective? And if that's the case, would you agree that, like, look, to train the upper portion of the glute max, the med, the min, probably need to be doing, like, legit abduction exercises, you know, with cables and leg raises and things like that, and not so much using bands around the knees and trying to hold the static degree of abduction during thrusts or squats or deadlifts or I mean this is one of those things where on social media if you I, like I've literally seen people put a band around their ankles while doing leg press thinking that that somehow is going to be challenging their their hip abductors which is pretty pretty impressive <laughs> yeah I've seen I think one person put six bands so I think I had like ankle then like knee then like hip like it's just the more bands the better uh so yeah I think I'm in agreement that I, I'm not sure how much it would detract from it, although I can't really see it adding in terms of like you're making something more complicated and potentially detracting. Um, I do wonder, and I know one of um, Brad's graduate students is going to do, uh, I don't think this will be super insightful, but um, an EMG study with that. But what I, what I think would be really insightful would be do the loads change with those two um, uh, conditions. So, so I'm excited to see her results. Yeah, have you done that? We, it, we have done it with maximum uh, isometrics, right? Mm -hmm. So basically creating just a sub-maximal block for the hip thrust and having people use either a band or then just do the thrust, right? Uh, and basically the EMG for the lower portion of the glutes, like basically everything that's associated with hip extension, goes down when you wear mm -hmm. the band right um and also the the maximum mm -hmm. force production goes down so you lose in both emg and in sagittal hip extension force by putting the band but which makes sense because the muscles that abduct don't they don't push the hip into as much extension so you kind of have like you're kind of creating a co-contraction that is somewhat fighting your, yourself there and then you're also like you know you're losing neural drive to trying to do that as well uh and then we found a similar thing on the 45 degree extension uh where basically like you know if you do the like excessive external rotation you know like frog stance thing in a, in a 45 degree hip extension that the force production goes way down and the amount of emg in the lower glutes goes way down actually 
when doing load, uh, it was worse than just ha having somebody do just like the body weight butt squeeze, right? Which I felt like I found that interesting that doing the maximal isometric, like once actually loaded, somebody, the EMG was less than them doing a maximal isometric against load in that relative position. So basically the hip mechanics were that poor in that position that like, okay, if all you just do is just use intent and squeeze your butt, that would is better than you maximally contracting into, you know, a fixed object. Um, so like, I'm interesting to see what they find, but yeah. <clears throat> you know, that, that we, we have, we have done that and that, that that's, that's, this is what we found. Right. But you know, small, small subjects, right. You know, just in, you know, little bro garage here. Right. <laughs> so Milo's been here. It's a, it's just a shack, right? It's nice. It's probably the nicest gym I've ever been to. So. Yeah, I've seen the I've seen the photos. It's definitely a sweet gym. Um, only uh, it's definitely a, probably a, a slight step up, but Doctor Mike Isertel's gym is also really nice. I think you oh, went there recently too. Yes. I was, I was. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. It's, so, I would say it's slightly nicer, but they're both nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Uh, so, who's so got the who's got the better pull down? <laughs> you, you. I didn't even use the pull down, so I couldn't call it actually. But I think you. Um. I will say with the worst of the bands, just to clarify, you're talking about around the knees, like kind of challenging. Okay, cool. Um, I'll say, I don't think it would make much of a difference, to be honest. Like I wouldn't expect to see much of a difference. And I would typically rather someone do their hip extension work and then do their abduction work somewhere else as an isolated movement. Just because if it's not even going to be targeting the same muscle, like obviously medius and minimus are probably going to be a lot more involved in abduction, whereas... Maximus is going to be a lot more involved in extension. In that case, you're just running the risk of adding a band to your leg press for it to not really add much stimulus to medius and minimus, but just adding an extra complication for not much reason. So I think you may as well separate the two and get both close to failure on their own, um, in their own right, I guess. Agreed. So mm -hmm. for the population that is looking to just like they're they're just going for you know as Daniel said those the juicy peach look, um, right? Uh, like we, we've discussed how like kind of my my like average approach for hypertrophy has been like all right you know seventy length and thirty short and is kind of like where I've kind of resided in in, in practice for for most of these things, but in this element like this that's the situation where I might shift that balance a little bit more mere for this best like the specificity component of it um and how much would be probably dependent on what exercise like selection stuff somebody has available obviously you know if somebody's training you know at a gym like i have i have tons of ways to bias the glutes in the lengthen position but if you don't have like some good leg presses or a multi-hip and you know cables where you can really stabilize yourself or whatnot then it's like well okay then if the goal is to kind of limit some of that other musculature growth then I may have to rely more on, you know, thrusts and regular style kickback things um, because that's the only way that I can get, I can bias the stimulus towards that. And I may need to, you know, it may require significant more volume and frequency, which is what I think that in practice has kind of happened between kind of people that exist in like that little specialty is that's what they found is like, okay, well, if we do these exercises, we can do a ton of them and we can do them often, you know, uh, and they're, I mean, clearly they're anecdotally, people are able to get a result this way right now. I think if, I think if you could apply that same level of bias to lengthened exercises, you'd probably get even better results. But if you are in the absolute fear of like, look, the judges told me that I can't have one more millimeter of quad then you may have to rely more on these exercises and that. And then would you guys agree with that? For the, for that population, there may be a certain safety in relying on exercises that they, like, look, I may have to do more of this. I may have to, you know, put a little bit more effort in it, do them a little bit more frequently, but I know that I'm going to keep my quads in my hands or my AD ejectors, like, out of this a little bit more. Yeah, I think being able to do a lot more volume in that shortened position makes a whole lot of sense in terms of if you're trying to cover all your bases and you don't have an unlimited amount of equipment available, you might have to do more work for potentially the same result 
or or maybe a slightly better result because of the whole cherry on top thing we were talking about. But I think you could cover your bases very well by just doing more work. You're, it's not as efficient. You could be spending more time doing something else, potentially uh, rounding out your physique and whatnot. But uh, I don't think that there's a distinct downside to doing more isolated shortened position work to get that requisite volume, even if sometimes it's an absurd amount of volume. So like you hear uh, Brett talk about like what his girls do and it's a whole lot like, you know, four times a week of, you know, many, many sets per day. So I think there's multiple ways to roam, um, potentially a more efficient way of doing things would be to try to get a good mix of both I, I tend to go 50 50 more for glutes and probably closer to 70 30 for for pretty much every other muscle group just because i think that the muscle that has the greatest ability in that shortened position is i think it is a little bit more isolated toward the glute that's why i, I go because even with the multi-hip would you expect the adductor magnus to be working pretty hard in that length and position yeah so how hard the adductor works in hip extension is going to be relative to the femur's orientation right and the leg path right so if you if you, anything where like you're either more sagittal or you're working like actually in an adduction to an abduction plane that's where you're really going to reduce the amount of adductor or if you have a slight external rotation that occurs mm -hmm. during the milk all of those things like Think of it this way, like the reason the hamstrings don't work at the squat is because they have mm -hmm. opposing function, right? And so that's essentially like same thing. The glutes themselves, like they lengthen actually by being adducted a little bit, which was why I wish, you know, for if we were, this was a glute study, I would have preferred a narrower stance, right? Um, so with the hip thrust, because you're basically holding relative mm -hmm. abduction and slide external rotation, that's probably the main reason if we look at it from a mechanical perspective, why we don't see as much adductor growth there versus like a wide squat. As you're doing hip extension, you are adducting with hip extension as a squat, right? Like, like if you were to just not do that motion as a squat and just do it like through the air, you'd be like, yes, this is hip extension in also a deduction. So if you're looking at how to limit the adductor, you're probably not going to do anything wider than sagittal per se and if anything bias more like for the glutes you'd actually be better off biasing more of your things to have a slightly you know adduction in front to abduction behind you right like we have which would be a cable the, right. yeah you could you could do it with the cable um you could like you can do like a like with a drop lunge or reverse lunge you can like kind of like shift your hip a little bit so that you know there's there's ways to do it you can step across a little bit on a leg press you know um, if you have the multi-hip, instead of just being straight sagittal, right, you can shift a little bit or you can actually put like a, a cuff around your leg and then a cuff around the multi-hip like I've posted videos. Just, like That's why I said like, look, if you know what you're doing, you could get a lot of lengthened exercises that were very glute biased and you would get all the benefits of the specificity and potentially then the benefits of the long muscle length. It's just that those options are maybe not as freely available in terms of equipment or as intellectually available to people to understand how to set them up and, and, and perform them. Whereas there's a plenty of just like conventional exercises that target the glutes and in a short position because they've just been around for, you know, you just set your foot up as a cable and you push it out to the side or, or whatever. Right. Um, you know, the, this is a much simpler, more common setup than what you would see like on our page where we're actually like getting the hip into like flexion and adduction to stretch the glutes, you know, and, and pushing out. So, by all means, you know, for people that want to grow their glutes as fast as possible, like I think there's learning that stuff is going to be extremely valuable, but you could do the like, Hey, I just want to put in a lot more time and take a more lazy approach. That's kind of the way I see is like the, or I, I should say it's, it's intellectually lazy to just rely on a bunch of exercises that are like, you know, partial short range positions or whatever, but you know, their glutes and uh, I'm just going to just shotgun it and do all of them and, and, and do a ton of them. Versus like, hey, I'm going to actually like seek out the most mechanically advantageous exercises to bias the glutes. And in, that, in coaching that population, one thing I've noticed is having people come from the like very high volume side and then trying to bring them back. There's like, there's like a mental problem with all of a sudden like, oh, wait, I'm only doing this much volume. And so I think that's one of the possible negatives of taking that approach is people get accustomed and then they think that the only way they're going to 
be able to make improvements is to do this obscene amount of volume that they've been doing to get those results. And they're going to find that one, they quickly can't do that with some of these other exercise variations. Right. And two, you then you, as a coach, you have to deal with the psychological barrier of people thinking that like, well, you're not writing me a good program or I'm not working hard enough because I'm not doing 40 sets of glutes a week, you know? So just some coaches caveats there. Yeah. And on the sensation question, I think the sensation is pretty sweet in that, in that stretch position, even for the glute with that bit of a deduction. So I think, uh, I tend to ignore the short sensation um, a bit more than the lengthened one. I think uh, sort of standardizing by the, and I'm sort of mentioning it so I can hear your opinion on this, uh, standardizing by sensation in the lengthened position I find to be useful because it's it seems to be more muscle-specific and uh, it sort of allows you to know exactly which range you're getting into and, and get there every time. While in the shortened position, because of like co-contractions and all that kind of stuff, it, 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 the, mu the waters are muddied a little bit more. Uh, what's your take on that? Your, your guy's take on that? I don't think that there's more specificity in terms of feel in the lengthened versus short position. Obviously, this is a hard thing to do because, you know, we can't plug each other like I can't plug myself into your brain. Um, and like when it comes to sensation, a lot of people have if they don't have in intimate knowledge of anatomy, right, or they have poor body awareness, like they, they feel a region, right? So, you know, so when we look at things like the seated hip abduction and whatnot, like a lot of people will be like, oh, yeah, I feel it in my glutes. But is it their glutes or is it the, actually their glute max or is it the posterior division of the glute med that they're feeling because that mechanically would make more sense? Or is it their piriformis or some of the other deep, like there's because we have muscles that are layered on top of each, on top of each other, right? And to ask the average gym goer to be able to be like oh yeah i can definitely tell that that's you know my iliac glute max that's you know <laughs> contracting there like yeah uh-huh sure it is uh you know uh so this is th this is why like my first thing would be like hey you know when it comes to how you set up an exercise how you perform it etc is having the knowledge of mechanics is kind of like the best foundation that, that you can have right because you know you're at least putting yourself in the ballpark where this tissue has good leverage and it, you're going to be taking it through, you know, a certain range of motion. Um, and then when it comes to sensation on top of that or whatnot, I kind of look at it as, is like, look, if people report a positive feeling to an exercise that I think that is set up and they're performing mechanically well, I'm like, cool, that's awesome. But what I don't want to do is in any way kind of like get people to start chasing sensations. Because the, the, the feeling you get in a short position is different than the feeling that you get in a lengthened position. And now, and if that's the goal, then all of a sudden now you're going to put that like, like, okay, now this is something that you need to feel in, in every exercise. And it's also going to differ widely across muscles. Like, so for two joint muscles, it's usually a lot easier to get to a, a sensation of a stretch in those muscles because we can use both joints to lengthen them. Um, but you won't necessarily get that. And we know that like, we're seeing benefits of like this length and bias stuff without necessarily having to get to a terminal stretch, right? Like a preacher curl is not a fully lengthened bicep, right? So the, what you're going to feel at the bottom of a preacher curl is not the same thing that you're going to feel than when you're in shoulder extension with your arm behind you. Right. And so I think that sensation is one of those things where it's, it's so complex that introducing that variable for a client is probably like at least 50 50 in terms of like whether or not it could do harm or good um you know and i think that the majority of your focus shouldn't be like how does the muscle feel like in terms of stretch or shortening or whatever um it should be more on them focusing on maintaining the technique that you want and putting an effort right like the feeling that they should learn is basically how to gauge RIR. I think that's the most important sensation that they could actually get in training is understanding their level of effort and and fatigue. Yeah, I think I'm, I think we're mostly on the same page. I take a more pragmatic approach in that I think certain muscles, to your point, are are much more susceptible to this, and because people are sort of chasing it, and it's much more obvious in certain instances that leaving that toward the end of a session and getting that dopamine rush while also potentially getting the benefit of the standardization for muscles where we know that that is the case, like an overhead tricep type thing, 
uh, whether that's necessary, meaning in terms of obviously like being in the uh, a more length and not the most because then there would be some uh, obviously other issues there but like just the sensation of more obvious cases I think can sort of add, be like a feed forward mechanism in in more obvious cases but I think we'd probably land on like fairly similar looking stuff either either way if you choose your exercises correctly as long as you're not sort of having people chase sensation in super non-obvious contexts and having them do all kinds of wonky stuff for that reason. Yeah, you could put put people in some weird positions. Yeah. The what you got, Milo? <laughs> the trend that I kind of noticed was that uh, when, like, mind-muscle connection took off, a lot of people started just gravitating their exercise selection towards the exercises that they could feel the most, which led people to choosing a lot of very short, you know, exercises or exercises where there was some sort of co-contraction or coordination demand that contributed to the sensation and not necessarily exercises that mechanically made the most sense for their goals. And sometimes the opposite, because you can get a really big sensation if you basically compromise a joint, right? Like you can get a really, really big sensation for that. So, um, you know, or is your, you know, you're basically creating, I don't really think that active insufficiency is something that we, that we get in traditional resistance training. Cause we just simply wouldn't be able to move the resistance there. That's it would kind of, it kind of works itself out, but you can get to the point where you're creating a huge stability demand at, you know, the joint that you're not supposed to be targeting, but then that leads to a big sensation. Cause you're essentially leading to the point where your body's kind of like, Hey, you know, I'm throttling you here so that I can, you know, kind of stabilize this other thing. Um, and we'd see that a lot with like people doing like weird things with their scapula and things like that, that would be, we'll say like mechanically not intuitive to the motion, but then the result would be like, oh, but now I feel this a, a ton. Right. And it's because they're essentially creating these co-contractions or destabilizing one of the other joints. And all of a sudden that leads to a very heightened feeling. But when we measure it, they're producing no mechanicals tension. So my general rule that I teach at our camps is that, look, if something improves in sensation and it, and it also tends to improve in performance in some way, whether that's reps or loading, then it, then it could possibly be a good sensation. But if something drastically improves in sensation, but you see performance and low drop, that probably, that sensation is probably actually negative feedback, right? But we, you know, when we feel, when you feel a muscle, like you don't necessarily know that like our ability to perceive mechanical tension is very, very low. What we're mostly perceiving is, is like the rate of firing in there. And when something is unstable, we have a higher frequency, you know, so we just, we get more feels, right? That's why, you know, people jump on a Bozu or a power plate or whatever. And like, oh man, I could really feel this. And I'm like, well, yeah, but like, it's still not much mechanical tension. And that's, that's the recipe that we're, that we're going for. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Milo, but I just had to throw that. All good. I was just going to throw in a quick caveat around all the mind muscle connection stuff. It's something that uh, people think there's a ton of evidence around. To my knowledge, there's one direct study on this, yeah. which was conducted at Brad Schoenfeld. And yep. the results weren't even particularly compelling in favor of a mind muscle connection as opposed to an external focus, like just being explosive. So... I think that there's much ado about very little evidence in this case. Like, do I think that conceptually it may or may not, it could help maybe, you know, like maybe by focusing on a specific muscle, you're able to recruit muscle fibers or muscle motor units earlier in the set somehow? Maybe. But equally, I don't really see a compelling reason for it to enhance muscle growth, and I don't think we have the direct evidence to support that stance. So... Yeah, I'm just skeptical, I guess. Would Would you guys agree that, if anything, the eccentric is either equal or more valuable for hypertrophy? I mean, to be honest, I haven't looked into the direct evidence comparing, say, eccentric only to concentric only to concentric and eccentric to isometric, and that's actually something I've been meaning to do for fucking years at this point. Um, Mike Israel commissioned us, like, two years ago uh, to do a literature review, systematic review on any study comparing those contraction modes on hypertrophy to see if there's any consistent differences like whether isometrics for example the one thing you have at the back of your head all the time when you're lifting is like oh isometric training isn't as good as concentric and eccentric training for hypertrophy 
is that true? I don't really know. Most people probably don't really know because there hasn't been a systematic review of these studies. Um, from what I've seen, and this is very sort of like superficial reading of literature, eccentric seems to, seems to be pretty important and seems to potentially lead to hypertrophy in different ways than concentric contractions. So that's why it might be important to have both. But that's a very sort of superficial reading. I think it probably is a bit more important potentially, yeah. But that's a very sort of, uh, here's $5. I'm going to bet $5 on this. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a decent amount. I haven't looked at it systemically, but I've seen enough to, I think it's a very fair statement to say equal or greater. So uh, you don't really see uh, concentrics. Very rarely do you see, the, I don't think I've ever seen a study where they outperform when looking at them in isolation. Um, and I've seen many equal, um, but how a lot of these studies were done is super murky. Like, how are they standardizing? Like, how do you really, like, standardized eccentric failure like how far uh from failure you are an eccentric is going to look a lot different than a concentric so there's a, a lot of issues uh the one study also like i think about uh fatigue within a set there was one study that did an overloaded eccentric plus concentric and didn't find greater growth in that regard so it could be that the fatigue from that overloaded inset eccentric was affecting the concentric and so on so i think there's a ton of variables that people don't consider when thinking about these questions so but yeah i think it's a fair characterization to say that it's important um well yeah. the reason i the reason i say that is is that most of the mind most of the techniques that people use to increase sensation or the intentions are either they can only be applied on the concentric or you know they're at least heavily biased towards the the concentric right because it's like all right you focus on squeezing a muscle on the concentric how do you focus on squeezing a muscle on the eccentric, right? That's some, that's some, I mean, you could be like, okay, I'm trying to, but I mean, what are you really trying to do when you're trying to squeeze while also do an eccentric at the same time? It's a little bit of mental gymnastics. So that's why it's, if I have the opportunity to make something more mechanically, you know, suited to that muscle versus trying to rely on tension. Cause like, for instance, that Brad study or the Brad Schoenfeld study, the leg extension group found basically no difference between trying to use a internal focus versus an internal focus. Um, but the exercise they did find, um, I believe it was, it was a bench press, right? Um, and what I would say is, is that if, if that makes a difference, that probably means the exercise selection or the technique that you're doing is missing something mechanically. And that's why there's room to improve it by just, you know, providing internal cueing to, to put tension into that tissue. But if you, if your exercise is good enough, then probably you would get no benefit because the nervous system should be using that tissue to overcome the load anyway. So probably the like the only places that I see benefit from de- from like using an internal focus and really heavily relying on that would be like if you're trying to take an exercise and make it something it isn't, right? You're trying to like fill the gap of like, well, this isn't quite the motion or quite the profile or whatever that I want. So I'm just trying to produce the tension just by just actively or internally cueing myself to contract the muscle even though the exercise wouldn't otherwise you know require me to recruit that muscle to that extent so you're basically trying to because that is exactly what's happened anytime you apply an internal intent to an exercise you're essentially creating an artificial aspect to that exercise right like you're basically starting to introduce forces that otherwise wouldn't be there from the exercise itself right so i would lean towards it's like hey if, if you're finding that the only way that you can make an exercise, you know, feel good or work for you is to like, just be really like hard drive, like, you know, mentally masturbating the muscle, then you probably should figure out how to improve your technique or choose a better exercise for that, for that muscle. It was a squat and a curl, right? The, the two exercises or the two exercises. It's leg extension and bench press. Pretty sure. Really? That's what I thought. Cool. Um, so well, yeah, I, I mean, I think we're... Milo to be like well read and know all the stuff and was going to give me a you know a ten second yes or no answer. So <laughs> I'll blame I'll blame him. But I'm pretty sure like I'll I'll put this down in the details or whatever and, and reference the study. But I'm pretty sure it was leg extension and bench press. Uh, this was what they were doing, right? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Well. Um, I think that's a good place to call it there. Thank you guys very much. You were very generous with your time and uh, for the little technical glitch that we had. Um, so 
Daniel, where can uh, where can people find you and follow your stuff? Uh, yeah, all the normal stuff, mostly Instagram. I, I am on Twitter, but rarely post. I mostly just troll researchers. So I think Instagram at Daniel Plotkin is probably the, the best way to find me. Um, the other ones you could follow me if you want to send me a question or my emails listed on the paper as well. So yeah, those channels would be good. And you, Milo? Yeah. So the one place to find me would probably be at Wolf Coach on Instagram. I do put out some YouTube content nowadays, so you can find that at Wolf Coaching on YouTube. And finally, for all my research output, you can find that if you just type in ResearchGate, Milo Wolf, on Google, you'll find all this stuff. And for those of you guys that are interested, uh, Milo and I are working on a length and bias training guide to not just cover the science, but a lot of the coaching pearls that uh, I have gathered over the time of teaching students and whatnot um, so that basically a lot of the nuances that we talked about today are very similar to the things um, that you'll be picked up there. So um, you can stay tuned for that. I will probably have a link in the details if you want to get an email notification for when it's released so that you can go ahead and pop that in there. Um, otherwise, you can find me at the usual places, Coach Kassam on Instagram or whatever. Don't be lazy. Just look at the details or whatever for all of the stuff. Um, and if you're interested in learning more of the nuances and stuff of how we do our training stuff, check out n1.education. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you give us a like, subscribe, and leave us a review, and we will see you on the next episode of the N1 Experience.